Okay, let's get our Anne read for today. Chapter 15, A Tempest in the School Teapot. What? What a splendid day, said Anne, drawing a long breath. Isn't it good just to be alive on a day like this? I pity the people who aren't born yet for missing it. They may have good days, of course, but they could never have this one. And it's splendider still to have such a lovely way to go to school by, isn't it? It's a lot nicer than going round by the road that is so dusty and hot, said Diana practically, peeping into her dinner basket and mentally calculating if three juicy, toothsome raspberry tarts reposing there were divided among ten girls how many bites each girl would have. The little girls of Avonlea school always pulled their lunches and to eat three raspberry tarts all alone, or even to share them only with one's best chum, would have forever and ever branded as awful mean the girl who did it. And yet, when the tarts were divided among ten girls, you just got enough to tantalize you, we used to say, just enough to make you mad. Let's see. The way Anne and Diana went to school was a pretty one. Anne thought those walks to and from school with Diana couldn't be approved upon, even by imagination. Going around by the main road would have been so unromantic. But to go by Lover's Lane and Willowmere and Violet Vale and the Birch Path was romantic, if ever anything was. Lover's Lane opened out below the orchard at Green Gables and stretched far up into the woods to the end of the Cuthbert Farm. It was the way by which the cows were taken to back pasture and the wood hauled home in winter. Anne had named it Lover's Lane before she had been a month at Green Gables. Not that lovers ever really walked there, she explained to Marilla, but Diana and I are reading a perfectly magnificent book, and there's a Lover's Lane in it, so we want to have one too. And it's a very pretty name, don't you think? So romantic, we can't imagine the lovers into it, you know? I like that lane because you can think out loud there without people calling you crazy. And starting out alone in the morning, went down Lover's Lane as far as the brook. Here Diana met her and the two little girls went on up the lane under the leafy arch of maples. Maples are such sociable trees, said Anne. They're always rustling and whispering to you until they came to a rustic bridge. Then they left the lane and walked through Mr. Berry's backfield and passed Willowmere. Beyond Willowmere came Violet Vale, a little green dimple, a little green dimple in the shadow of Mr. Andrew Bell's big woods. Of course, there are no violets there now, Anne told Marilla, but Diana says there are millions of them in spring. Oh, Marilla, can't you just imagine you see them? It actually takes away my breath. I named it Violet Vale. Diana says she never saw the beat of me for hitting on fancy names for places. It's nice to be clever at something, isn't it? But Diana named the birch path. She wanted to do. She wanted to, so I let her, but I'm sure I could have found something more poetical than plain birch path. Anybody can think of a name like that, but the birch path is one of the prettiest places in the world, Marilla. It was. Other people besides Anne thought so when they stumbled on it. It was a little narrow twisting path winding down over a long hill straight through Mr. Bell's woods where the light came down sifted through so many emerald screens that it was as flawless as the heart of a, of a diamond. It was fringed in all its length with slim young birches white-stemmed and lissom bowed ferns and star flowers and wild lilies of the valley and scarlet tufts of pigeon berries grew thickly along it and always there was a delightful spiciness in the air and must and music of bird calls and the murmur and laugh of woods winds in the trees overhead 
Now and then you might see a rabbit skipping across the road if you were quiet, which with Anne and Diana happened about once in a blue moon. In a blue moon. Down in the valley, the path came out to the main road, and then it was just up the spruce hill to the school. The Avonlea school was a whitewashed building, low in the, in the, in the eaves and wide in the windows, furnished inside with comfortable, substantial, old-fashioned desks that opened and shut and were carved all over and were carved all over their lids with the initials and hieroglyphics of three generations of school children. The schoolhouse was set back from the road, and behind it was a dusky fir wood and a brook where all the children put their bottles of milk in the morning to keep cool and sweet until the dinner hour. Marilla had seen Anne start off to school on the first day of September with many secret misgivings. Misgivings. Anne was such an odd girl. How would she get on with the other children, and how on earth would she ever manage to hold her tongue during school hours? <laughs> Things were better than Marilla feared, however. Anne came home that evening in high spirits. I think I'm going to like school here, she announced. I don't think that much of the master, though. He's all the time. He's all the time curling his mustache and making eyes at Prissy Andrews. <laughs> Prissy's grown up, you know. She's 16, and she's studying for the entrance examination into Queen's Academy at Charlottetown next year. Tilly Bolter says the master is dead gone on her. She's got a beautiful complexion and curly brown hair, and she does it up so elegantly. She sits in the in the long seat. Hang on. She sits in the long seat at the back. And he sits there too most of the time to explain her lessons, he says. But Ruby Gill Gillis says she saw him writing something on her slate. And when Prissy read it, she blushed as red as, as a beet and giggled. And Ruby Gillis says she doesn't believe it had anything to do with the lesson. And surely don't let me hear you talking about your teacher in that way again, said Marilla sharply. You don't go to school to criticize the master. I guess he can teach you something, and it's your business to learn, and I want you to understand right off that you are not to come home telling tales about him. That is something I won't encourage. I hope you were a good girl. Indeed I was, said Anne comfortably. It wasn't so hard as you'd imagine, either. I sit with Diana. Our seat is right by the window, and we can look down to the lake of shining waters. There are a lot of nice girls in school, and we had scrumptious fun playing at dinner time. It's so nice to have a lot of little girls to play with. But, of course, I like Diana best, and always will. I adore Diana. I'm dreadfully far behind the others. They're all, they're all in the fifth hook. Hang on. The bad ass girl, I don't write down. I'm dreadfully far behind. They're all in the fifth book, and I'm only in the fourth. I'm getting sleepy again. I feel that it's kind of a disgrace, but there's not one of them has such an imagination as I have. Ah. Uh. And I soon found that out. We were reading and geography. We had reading and geography and Canadian history and dictation today. Mr. Phillips said my spelling was disgraceful and he held up my slate so everybody could see it. All marked over. I felt so mortified, Marilla. He might have been politer to a stranger, I think. Ruby Gillis gave me an apple and Sophia Sloan. Gave me a lovely pink card with May I See You Home on it. I'm to give it back to her tomorrow. And Billy Bolter let me wear her bead ring all the afternoon. Can I have some of those pearl beads off the old pin cushion in the garret to make myself a ring? And oh, Marilla, Jane Andrews told me that Minnie McPherson told her that she heard Prissy Adams tell Sarah Gills, Gillis that I had a very pretty nose. 
<laughs> my real that's the first compliment I have ever had in my life and you can't imagine what a strange feeling it gave me Marilla have I really a pretty nose I know you'll tell me the truth your nose is well enough said Marilla shortly Secretly, she thought Anne's nose was a remarkable pretty one, but she had no intention of telling her so. That was three weeks ago, and all had gone smoothly so far. And now this crisp September morning, Anne and Diana were tripping blithely down the birch path. Two of the happiest little girls in Avonlea. I guess... Gilbert Blythe will be in school today, said Diana. He's been visiting his cousins over in New Brunswick all summer, and he only came home Saturday night. He's awfully handsome, Anne, and he teases the girls something terrible. He just torments our lives out. Torments our lives out. Diana's voice indicated that she rather liked having her life tormented out than not. Gilbert Blythe, said Anne. Isn't his name? That's written up on the porch wall with Julia Bells and a big take notice over them? Yes, said Diana, tossing her head, but I'm sure he doesn't like Julia Bell so very much. I've heard him say he studied the multiplication table by her freckles. Oh, don't speak about freckles to me, implored Anne. It isn't delicate when I've got so many. But I do think that writing take notice... That writing take notices... Writing take notices up on the wall about the boys and girls is the silliest ever. I should just like to see anybody dare to write my name up with the boys. Not, of course, she hesitated to add, that anybody would. Anne sighed. She didn't want her name written up, but it was a little humiliating to know that there was no danger of it. Nonsense, said Diana, whose black eyes and glossy tresses had played such havoc with the hearts of Avonlea schoolboys at her name figured on the porch walls in a half a dozen short notices. It's only half meant as a joke. And don't and don't you to be sure your ham won't ever be written up. And I didn't get oh gosh. Excuse me. It's going off. <laughs> I think I fell asleep. Uh where was I? Ham. Doggone it. I'm lost. No danger of it. Nonsense. Who's supposed to uh, that her name? Uh, and don't you be too sure your name will ever be written up. Charlie Sloan is dead gone on you. He told his mother... His mother, mind you, that you were the smartest girl in school. That's better than being good looking. I said something about ham, didn't I? <laughs> so weird when I read myself to sleep. No, it isn't, said Anne, feminine to the core. I'd rather be pretty than clever, and I hate Charlie Sloan. I can't bear a boy with Google eyes. If anyone wrote my name up there with his, I'd never get over it, Diana Berry. But it is nice to keep head of your class. You'll have, have Gilbert in your class after this, said Diana, and he's used to being head of the class. I can tell you he's only in the fourth book, although he's nearly 14. Four years ago, his father was sick and had to go out to Alberta for his health, and Gilbert went with him. They were there three years, and Gil didn't go to school hardly any until they came back. You won't find it so easy to keep head after this, Anne. I'm glad, said Anne quickly. I could really feel proud of keeping head of little, of little boys and girls of just nine or ten. I got up yesterday spelling, oh my gosh, evolution, evolution. E-B-U-L-L-I-T-I-O-N, but there's a little... 
mark before the E, like an apostrophe, like a letter's been left out. Josie Pry was head, and mind you, she peeped in her book. Mr. Phillips didn't see her. He was looking at Prissy Andrews, but I did. I just swept her a look of freezing scorn, and she got as red as a beet and spelled it wrong after all. Those pie girls, P-Y-E, are cheats all round, said Diana indignantly as they climbed the fence of the main road. Gertie Pie, P-Y-E, actually went and put her milk bottle in my place in the brook yesterday. Did you ever? I don't speak to her now. <laughs> when Mr. Phillips was in the back of the room hearing Prissy Andrews Latin, Diana whispered to Anne, that's Gilbert Blythe sitting right across the aisle from you, Anne. Just look at him and see if you don't think he's handsome. Anne looked accordingly. She had a good chance to do so, for the said Gilbert Blythe was absorbed in stealthily pinning the long yellow braid of Ruby Gillis, who sat in front of him to the back of her seat. He was a tall boy with curly brown hair. Roguish hazel eyes and a mouth twisted into a teasing smile. Presently, Ruby Gillis started up to take a sum to the master. She fell back into her seat with a little shriek, believing that her hair was pulled out by the roots. Everybody looked at her and Miss Phillips glared. Glared so sternly that Ruby began to cry. Gilbert had whisked the pen out of sight and was studying the history with the soberest face in the world. But when the commotion subsided, he looked at Anne and winked with ex inexpressible droll drollery. I think your Gilbert Blythe is handsome, confided Anne to Diana, but I think he's very bold. It isn't good manners to wink at a strange girl. But it was not until the afternoon that ugly things really began to happen. Mr. Phillips was back in the corner explaining a problem in algebra to Prissy Andrews. And the rest of the scholars were doing pretty much as they pleased, eating green apples, whispering, drawing pictures on their states, slates, and driving crickets harnessed to strings up and down aisle. Gilbert Blythe was trying to make Anne Shirley look at him and failing utterly because Anne was at that moment totally oblivious not only to the very existence of Gilbert Blythe but of every other scholar in Avonlea. Mm, sorry. Avonlea school itself, with her chin propped on her hands and her eyes fixed on this blue glimpse of the lake of shining waters that was that the west window afforded, she was far away in a gorgeous dreamland, hearing and seeing nothing save her own wonderful visions. Gilbert Blythe wasn't used to used to putting himself out to make a girl look at him and meeting with failure. She should look at him, that red-haired haired Shirley girl with the little pointed chin and the big eyes that weren't like the eyes of any other girl in Avonlea school. Gilbert reached across the aisle, picked up the end of Anne's red blonde, long red braid, held it out at arm's length, and said in a piercing whisper, Carrots! Carrots! Then Anne looked at him with a vengeance. She did more than look. She sprang to her feet, her bright fancies falling into cureless ruin. She flashed one indignant glance at Gilbert from eyes whose angry sparkle was, was swiftly quenched in equally angry tears. You mean ha hateful boy, she exclaimed passionately. How dare you? And then, thwack. Anne had dropped her slate down on Gilbert's head and cracked it. Slate, not head. Clear across. Avonlea School always enjoyed a scene. That was an especially enjoyable one. Everyone, uh, everyone said, oh, in horrified der delight. Diana gasped. Ruby Gillis, who was inclined to be hysterical, began to cry. Tommy Sloan let his team of crickets escape him together while he stared open-mouthed at the tableau. tableau. 
Mr. Phillips stalked down the aisle and laid his hand heavily on Anne's shoulder. Anne, surely, what does this mean? He said angrily. Anne returned no answer. It was asking too much of flesh and blood to expect her to tell before the whole school that she had been called carrots. Gilbert was... Gilbert... Hang on. Called carrot. Gilbert it was who spoke up stoutly. It was my fault, Mr. Phillips. I teased her. Mr. Phillips paid no heed to Gilbert. I'm sorry to see a pupil of mine displaying such a temper and such a vindictive spirit, he said in a solemn tone. Anne looked as if the mere fact of being a pupil of his ought to root out all evil passions from the hearts of small and perfect mortals. Anne, go and stand on the platform in front of the blackboard for the rest of the afternoon. Guys, I'm sorry. Getting too sleepy. Doggone it. I hope I could come back later and read the rest of this. <laughs> See, look at these eyes again. Okay. <laughs> that was terrible reading, too. I'll try to be more awake when I come back to do the rest of it, I hope. See, I hope to see you at five today, and I hope to see you at uh, Krista's Secret Yarnery coming on in about a half an hour. See ya. Love you. Be sweet. Don't be ugly.